I'm going to talk a little bit about hooks. I'll just briefly show you a very simple hook. Um, I might, for example, not want to be able to save this job card unless the salesperson has a value. So I've created a little hook here already. If you look at this hook, you don't need to be a programmer. If the field called sales is empty, then pop up a little window and say, please enter a salesperson and then fail the save. That's all this does, it's very simple. So I have a job here, I don't have a salesperson. If I go and change it and press save, whoop, please enter a salesperson pops up and then it won't let me save. So I've got to actually go and enter a salesperson before it will actually let me save the job. So that's an example of a very simple hook. But hooks can get very complicated as well. And I won't really go through the details of complicated hooks, but hooks mirror the business rules that relate to that particular company that you're dealing with. They're not standard TSM. We don't really want to do send give it to a program in a modified TSM. What we want to do is we want to program external business rules into TSM to match what that business does, whatever that might be. So there are typically um, three types of hooks that we use. One is a validation hook to make sure they can't enter invalid data into the system. It's checks, it's whatever, like that one with the salesperson that we did to really you know, make sure the data is clean, make sure that they're doing the right thing. Uh, the second kind of hook that we might do is an action hook. If something occurs, then do something. If, for example, we have equipment with a checklist and you put, you failed any of those pieces of equipment, then automatically go and raise a job with that equipment on it to send to someone to go and investigate the reasons for the failure and go and repair the failure, for example, and email that to somebody, for example. Um, and the third use for a hook is to set default values. So you may, for example, want to, when I create a new job, automatically put values into certain fields because that's the way we want to do things um, and so on. So hooks can do defaults, they can do validation, and they can do actions, whatever actions they want to be. A good use for a hook, for example, is, is if you find that you're doing some repetitive task. I am constantly creating a uh, do and charge type job. I am going and picking the employee out of the list that usually services this particular location and then I am emailing the job to the employee. Well, if for a rule you could determine who the employee was for a particular job based on some rule, you could make a script that when I save the job, automatically calculate the employee, put that employee on the job, and then immediately email that job out to the employee. It may not be a real world example, but it gives you an idea of, you know, because that will save me having to pick the employee and having to go and think about it and having to go, because I do this over and over and over again, day after day after day. So hooks are very good for reducing administrative cost by automating repetitive processes. It's another area where hooks are very good. Um, look, I could speak all day on hooks, and hooks can be three lines, like I showed you in that example, or hooks can be an entire program, you know, thousands of lines with pop-up screens and, and, you know, calling out to external, you know, web services and bringing data in from external service sources and, you know, could do a real-time lookup against some external price database and, you know, update your price in real time or whatever it wanted to do. Hooks can be complex programs as well as very trivial little tiny scripts as well. So that's pretty much what a hook is. Uh, is that what TSM said based on what the customers want? Like specific customers who said, could you set yes. this up as yes. a default validation or an action for on our behalf? It depends on their workflow of their right. business. You know, if during the consulting phase, we determined that they have these particular business processes. Mm. Uh, we're doing one right now for a company, I won't say who, and the part of the workflow, there's a whole bunch to it, is that once we've sent the job out to the contractor to do the work, they send in emails on a regular basis um, updating the status, you know, we've, we've received the order, we were in transit, we've arrived on site, and so on and so forth. And, 
what they wanted is a hook that would go and process those emails and automatically update the no, I'll, I'll rephrase that. There is a process that takes in place where those emails are received, I'll talk about that separately, it's called an XML processor, and goes and updates the status on the job. And what they wanted was a, a, a business logic built in that as the status code changed, they wanted various people to be emailed with notifications that those status codes have changed. And the people differ depending on what stage the status is at. And so we built into the rules of the scripting that whenever the status code changed, these are the rules and this set of people need to be emailed and then we would go and create an email and put the email address to those people and automatically send out the emails to those people to notify them, for example. You know, that would be a, a more complex example of, of a rule. So what is a rule? It's, it's everything and it's nothing, right? You know, it's just whatever is relevant to the client in terms of coding their system. Now you have to also bear in mind a couple of things. It takes time to write, to design rules. It takes time to write the rules. And very often the customer has no idea what they need as well, okay? And so we don't typically jump right in and write a whole bunch of scripts for people. This is something that develops over time you know, as they get used to TSM, as they kind of see where things can be made more efficient, then we'll write a few rules and whatever. It's not it's, it's not cheap to write rules because it takes time, it takes thought, it's programming, you know, but we can do it. Um, it's an enterprise, well, it's not for enterprise, but it's an enterprise type feature that differentiates us from our competitors in the ability to write these rules without having to have a custom version of the software just for you, for example. That's great. Okay. Um, in seven, we have rules on steroids. Okay, it's rules on steroids. But will still be written in Fox Project? No. Seven will not be written in Fox Project. It's nothing to do with Fox Project. Seven will be written in Java. But the rules are expanded in seven to do even more. So Lots of more room bus. Is that right? In that sense? More hooks. More hooks. In six, we have hooks in various places. Right. And there are sometimes places that we would like to have hooks where we don't have hooks. For example, in six, if I wanted to say a rule was, every time I change the salesperson, or every time I change this field, if I change it to X, put Y into here, okay, automatically. Based on the value that I change this field, automatically put a value in here. I can't do that in six, so I don't have hooks at the data entry level. I can do it after I press save, but not at the point where I enter a value into a field, because there's no hooks at that point. Uh, in seven, every single call to everything in the entire system has a hook. So it's and, like interconnected in a way. Well, it's I mean, more than that. Right. It's more than that. We can actually augment and replace code within seven based on a hook. We could replace an entire function inside seven with our own hook. We could add this onto the end of any function before, during, or after with a hook. There's no limits to what we can do with hooks in seven. Okay. It's everywhere, in everything, whereas in six it's only at certain logical points where we have the hooks. Okay, so that's um, scripting.